Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Keith Marin about building extraordinary organizational cultures. Keith Marin, welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back. I'm excited to continue our conversation. Uh, last time we were talking about remarkable leadership and some of the characteristics of that. Uh, and I would encourage listeners to go back into our back catalog and to check out that episode. That was a really great conversation. Today, we're going to be focusing uh, well, really on a subcomponent of of what makes for great leadership, and that is building extraordinary organizational cultures. I think great leaders know how to do that and everything that they do, all their activities, all of their involvement with their people is uh, built around this idea of they need to create, maintain and sustain a really healthy dynamic um, culture for the organization in order for people to achieve their greatest potential. So we're, we're going to explore that together today. Uh, As we get started, I wanted to share Keith's bio with everyone again, in case you didn't catch the last episode. Dr. Keith Marin is a highly respected organizational consultant and leadership developer, and is the founder and managing partner of Leadership Pathways, as well as a partner at Barbara Annis and Associates. Keith received his doctorate from Harvard University in 1985, where his studies span the fields of human and organizational development. His early research on the relationships between human development, managerial effectiveness, and high performance played a profound role in helping shape a whole new field of study called spiral dynamics. Keith has designed and led over 100 seminars and workshops for leaders. In partnership with his clients, he has successfully conducted over 25 large system strategic, cultural, and technical change efforts. Companies hire Keith for one of the following three reasons, to achieve sustainable high performance and industry leadership, to design and lead innovative leadership training programs, and for building extraordinary organizational cultures, which we'll be talking about today. His work has positively impacted companies like Hewlett Packard, Amerigroup Corporation, Medcath, Wang Laboratories, General Public Utilities, World Corp., uh, CSAA, Endocare, the Health Care Financial Management Association, as well as 350 other companies and organizations. Additionally, he is the author of five books uh, on human and organizational change, and I'll uh, list all of those in the show notes. Keith teaches leadership, teamwork, and change management at Holt, at the Holt School of Business and is a high-demand uh, speaker on the subject of leadership and building extraordinary organizational cultures. So welcome back, Keith. It's awesome to have you back on the podcast. I'm excited to have this conversation. Before we launch in uh, to the dialogue, anything else you would like to add by way of background or personal context for the listeners? Yes, I think you have a little bit of an older bio. Yeah, I should I should add uh, the sixth book. My most recent book is The Art of Transformational Coaching. We'll talk about that a little later. But I do want to mention something that you might find of interest, which is that you may recall, and many of the listeners may or may not know, that in 1982, a book came out called Corporate Cultures. And it made the whole concept of corporate culture famous. It was written by Terry Deal. Uh, and uh, it was along along with um, In Search of Excellence, which came out at the same time. Both of those books really put the concept of corporate culture on the map in a big way. And the reason why I mention this is because Terry Deal was my doctoral advisor at Harvard. And so I got in on the ground floor of this culture change movement. Um, and I've been probably because I studied with the guy who wrote the book, 
um, been doing more culture change work and culture development than just about anybody on the planet. Um, it's what I love to do. It's where I put my attention and I help leaders create healthy cultures. So it is a topic very much on my mind and in my heart for the past close to 40 years now. That's wonderful. And thank you for sharing a little bit of that, that history and background. That's, that's really, uh, incredible, uh, that you have that, that direct connection and it does speak to not only your level of expertise and experience, you know, in the field and, and in this particular topic area. Um, but I appreciate the passion for the topic. Uh, it's a passion yeah. that I share, um, for organizational culture and, and change leadership. Uh, I think these are some of the types of skills that modern day leaders need to have if they ha- have any chance of you know, leading successful organizations into this extremely uncertain future with all of these disruptive forces at play. Um, we just need to be agile. We need to, uh, we need to be flexible and adaptive. And that's hard to do while maintaining a healthy dynamic culture where people feel empowered, they feel supported, uh, and that, that the people within the organization have the opportunity to maximize their potential um, to their own benefit, but to the benefit of the organization as well. So that's that's not an easy thing to do. And that's why we talk about these things um, to oh, hopefully yeah. give people some ideas on what they can do to start, um, you know, making a bigger impact uh, in their own workplace. I agree. It is not easy. That's partly why you and I have a job. We get to help help leaders do just that. Yeah. And, you know, I I've been doing this not as long as you, but I've been doing this for, you know, the last uh, 15 plus years. And the more I do it, the more I realize, like, it, it's, it's, it is hard, it's not easy, but it's also not often rocket science either. Um, like there are principles that you can um, carry out, like if you follow sustainably and consistently, that can make a huge impact. And And it's, it's, it's not rocket science. And so I'm hoping that we can today, we can distill down, you know, some, some key points that anyone listening can start to think about self-reflect on, uh, consider how, you know, they might be able to make an immediate difference uh, for their people, even starting today or tomorrow, they can go out and they can, and they can start um, doing some things to create a more dynamic and healthy culture uh, within their organization. So as we get started, Keith, again, I appreciate the uh, the background on that. Um, you talk about building extraordinary organizational cultures. Yeah. Um, why why do you use the word extraordinary? Uh, I mean, I think everyone knows they want a good, healthy, dynamic culture, um, but I, I suspect there's something more to the, oh, yeah. your choice to use that word. Oh, yeah. Well... A couple of reasons. Part of it is just personal to me. Uh, as you may recall in our last conversation, I'm just fascinated with mastery of anything. So um, uh, m- most of my books have have a strong bend toward what is it, what does it mean to do something remarkable or to be remarkable or create something remarkable and um, and achieve some form of mastery. And uh, and so that I'm just fascinated by that. But more importantly, as, as you're aware, the research on organizational effectiveness and on return on investment on, on organizational growth shows that in the long run, the quality of the culture is far more important than any other singular variable, including strategy, um, including the quality of your product, and of course, market timing, um, good luck. Uh, good product, good idea, all make a difference. But they make a difference in a given moment in time. You can put a product out there or a service out there, and it could be great at one point in time. But then the greater it is, the more you'll have competition coming in to try to do even better than you. And so the question becomes, how do you create a culture that can can build and build and build? And... uh, And so the research shows that the organizations that have extraordinary cultures, um, above average, let's say, well above average, have a greater chance for success in the long run. And so if you're playing the long game, as 
almost all my clients are doing, then uh, the, the culture matters a lot. And therefore, the biggest strategic advantage one could have in the long run is a great culture more than anything else. Yeah. Oh, I, I completely agree with that. And it's interesting to me because I see so many organizations and leaders, you know, usually well-meaning, um, but but they they undermine their own sustainable, dynamic, healthy culture by some of these short-term choices that they make in terms of strategic direction, product launches, how they engage with their customers, how they how they um, uh, lead their people and, and manage their people within the organization. And so this, this, the bigger picture, like long game, the long-term um, look at the role of organizational culture and, and having that, that dynamic culture, it really does matter. And when we get too caught up in the current moment uh, yeah. and quarterly earnings reports and, you know, all those sorts of things, we tend to be really great at short-term orientation uh, <laughs> in Western cultures, particularly in the United States, you know, it, there, there's some benefit to that, but, but honestly, and in, in, it can also really undermine your, your focus and your attempts towards this long-term culture. Um, what, what would you suggest to clients as a way to, to stay grounded and connected to these long-term goals and, and your, your long-term uh, cultural orientation in the midst of you know, immediate challenges that you're facing. Uh, you, you have disruptions, you're worried about the pandemic, whatever. You start to take shortcuts around your people, around the organizational cultural elements. And then before you know it, you're spiraling and, and doing a lot of things that you wouldn't have done, you know, a year prior. What, what can uh, leaders do to stay connected and grounded? Well, I think that it, it starts really with a personal choice. It's not, now, now if you're in an organization that is already short-term oriented, then it, it, it's difficult. But I'm gonna to speak to the leader who has control over their destiny in some meaningful way. And so it's, it really is a personal choice. And it, it's where do you stand in your life? Are you leading with the intent? Are you building an organization with your intent to sell? Or are you building it with the intent to last? Are you building an organization where you want to have a legacy and where that organization endures well beyond you? And those are personal choices as far as I'm concerned. You can go in either direction and anything in between. As soon as you pitch your tent in the arena of short term, then you make decisions such as, well, I need some investment capital from, from an angel investor or from a uh, venture capitalists and venture capitalists, as we all know, have kind of a three to five year time horizon. And their intent is very clear, build it to sell. They want an exit strategy and their money is not patient. Their investment is not patient. And so you kind of sell your soul to the devil in a sense. And I'm not saying uh, venture capitalists, all my venture capitalist friends might not like hearing this, but you sell your soul to, or you sell your business to a venture capital company that has a short-term horizon, already it's going to be tough to build anything of legacy. <clears throat> now you still can, depending on who you're partnering with and depending on what their aims are. But it's kind of go big or go home in the venture capital world. But somebody who is building a company to last and really wants to leave a legacy states that up front names it, declares it, partners with investment capital that is a little more patient and who understands that, and now they have a chance. Similarly, when they sell to a uh, sell the company to a, um, a private investment firm or something like that, or private equity, um, you know, there are different kinds of private equities. Some are patient, some are not. So I think it really starts with what is your stance right from the get-go and now you have a greater ability to build over time because you have partners who are patient with you. Um, once you're clear that you want to build over time, then every single investment you make, every single choice you make, you're facing the same question. 
do I take a shortcut or do I not? And um, I, I don't think there's any secret sauce here. Just keep looking at the long run and ask yourself the question, which is the best way to go? Do I lay people off or do I not? Do we, do we um, put this product out that has some problems with it? Or do we wait another quarter until it's ready to go? What happens if we put it out sooner? Well, we may make more money right now, but we may pollute our reputation. I'm saying that those choices are going to be in front of every single company and every single leader. And it starts with one's own personal stance. And then the choices become clear. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. And it, it so it does come back to our personal kind of ethical, moral um, compass, right? And our own values and how we prioritize those things. And so right. if, if we if we prioritize long-term growth, sustainability, legacy, investing in our people, uh, if those are our top priorities, that will trickle down into all of the small everyday decisions that we're making uh, within the organization, all the policies, practices, procedures, uh, how we interact with our people, how people are held accountable. um, All of that, right, will will, um, be built around these longer term visions uh, and priorities. And we can't, I, I think it's important to, we can't understate the, 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 the essential nature of that kind of an orientation as we, uh, as we carry out our daily work. So if I'm a CEO or a C-suite exec, um, or even, you know, a middle all the way down the line uh, leader within the organization, even down to just the lowest supervisory levels, you know, I have to be thinking about how my actions do impact impact uh, the perceptions of my people, how they interact with each other, uh, and this, the stated long-term goals of that culture. And if I'm not doing that, then chances are, you know, if I'm not consciously thinking about it and, and working towards it, chances are I'm going to inadvertently, you know, perhaps not purposely, but usually inadvertently, I'm going to do things that are going to undermine, um, you know, my desired long-term intent. Uh, yeah. And it's, I think that's just human nature. Um, you know, because we all get distracted and we all, the, the siren call of immediate gratification, <laughs> you know, is, is, is a challenge for everybody. I, I don't know anyone who's perfect at, you know, setting those sorts of things aside and perfect at setting your ego aside. Um, so we just have to constantly be coming back to that and find ways to be centered around what matters most to us um, yes. and re- reconnect with that. Agreed. Agreed. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Most of the leaders that I know that are really extraordinary, um, and I know a number of them at, at this point in my career, um, you know, they, they recognize this. And, and here, this is just a simple example that, that everybody knows well. Almost every corporation on the planet has a set of values, and they put those out there. Uh, you know, this comes from the research that we did 40 years ago, and Terry Deal really did it. I, I was 
learning from him, so I should say he did it, but I was quite familiar with this research that, that showed that organi- to create a strong organizational culture, you need to have a set of principles that guide us. Well, so everybody knows, you and I know, we face this all the time. We face decisions where, what do I do? Do I go after the money? Do I do cut corners here? And what are my values? Tell me. Well, my values are almost always enduring. Values for excellence, values for honesty, values for, for um, uh, demonstrating care for other people. Those are principles that we all live by. But in any given moment, we're faced with a choice. Well, the leader of the organization that stays true to the values of the organization and him or herself will create greater trust. That trust creates loyalty. That loyalty creates stability in the organization. It also attracts other people who share those same values. The moment the the leader compromises those values and says, okay, I'm not going to tell the truth to the customers, or let's not tell them we have a problem over here because we're afraid we might lose a little bit of business. Wells Fargo, who, who, who bends their, the data around, um, uh, uh, around their income um, t- in order to poof up their stock value, in order to attract more customers in the short run, the trust level plummeted the moment they made that decision. Had they made a different decision and said, no, we're not going to try to poof up anything here. We're going to stay the course in terms of our values. That's the moment they reclaim or they, they solidify their trust. So that's a simple example. We face it all the time. You want to create a great culture? Stay true to the principles that you state. Not so easy, but that's the key more important than any other variable as it relates to culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so having a clear understanding of your core values and how they're prioritized and then staying committed to those in the long term. Uh, And you mentioned how that directly impacts trust, loyalty, commitment. Uh, What are some of those other factors that you've seen over the years, both in your research, as well as your consulting work uh, around creating that dynamic, extraordinary culture? Yeah, so I, this is something I, uh, I've been drumming this into all my students and all my clients for God knows how long. But the key to organizational success is alignment. Alignment and commitment are really the two variables, or alignment and ownership. And what you're trying to do when you create an organization, you create a condition where people are all moving in the same direction toward a clear shared goal. And they're working well together. That's what alignment is. We're, uh, we're, we're working together. Our, our rows are, our, our oars are rowing in the same direction toward that aim. And we feel a sense of ownership. We have a direct experience of this is my organization. This is not our organization. It's mine. I own this psychologically. I care about what we're creating. I care about what we're doing. So those are the two dimensions that everything else revolves around. And so you, you know, ask the question, how do you create alignment? And now you get a clue to, or how do you create a alignment and commitment? You get a clue to what it takes. So some of the keys are strategic clarity. Do we know where we're going? Do we know why we're going in that direction? Do we have a, a competitive, a, stri- a strategic aim that differentiates us from our competition? Do we know what we're doing in terms of our culture? Do we have a clear sense of what we're creating in the culture? Does that strategy and that culture align with each other? Are they congruent with each other? For example, do we have a innovation strategy? And if we do, that our strategy depends upon constantly innovating, we need to have a culture of innovation, a culture of creativity. Um, So, uh, another variable uh, would be to what extent do we cultivate a sense of accountability and responsibility in our organization? Do we create conditions where people can choose and own? Do they have freedom of choice? If so, we'll create greater ownership. If we're highly top down and the leaders are telling other people what to do, 
they will comply. Others will comply. They'll go, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, I'll do whatever you tell me. But they'll be relating to the organization as children, being told what to do, or they'll do it out of obligation, not out of true choice. And we know that when people do things out of choice, they're much more likely to take put extra effort, residual effort, putting into the organization. They'll be in the shower thinking about their business and their organization. Um, on vacation, they'll be thinking about it. So um, I'd say those are uh, all crucial. I think um, how we work together, how we play in the same sandbox is going to be uh, 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 also equally crucial. So I'll stop there. I'm sure that's sparking some thoughts on your end. Um, but like you say, it's not rocket science, when, especially when you identify those two variables, alignment and commitment. Yeah, alignment and commitment are so key. And I think about, I've done quite a bit of research in terms of person job fit, person organization fit. Um, those speak to the alignment mm -hmm. elements that you're describing. And so if you want broader alignment uh, within the organization towards this common goal culture, that's that's the intentionality of, of everyone involved, that's only going to work as you attract and retain people who are in alignment with with that culture. Right. And yes. so that, that's one of the reasons why um, the, the selection process is so important, why retention of top talent and people who align with the organizational vision and culture is so key and important. And I think sometimes we really, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes uh, as leaders, you know, we think too much in terms of the metrics behind people and their performance and not enough about some of those really difficult to quantify elements like alignment <laughs> and yeah. and uh, someone's commitment to the culture, because that makes a huge, huge difference in the long run. Yeah. So I'll give you, a, a, to, to build on what you're saying, I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple of very specific things that people can do. Um, one of them is, and this, this comes out of the, the book, uh, First Break All the Rules, which came out about 15 years ago. And, yeah, that's that's and, one of, one of my favorite books that got me interested in yeah. in a lot of what we've been talking about. Yeah, the, the central premise, and it 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 plays out all the time in my client organizations and every others that I'm aware of, is that people don't leave organizations; they leave their managers. So, so um, usually the CEO of the organization is a symbol of of the organization, and but not many people interact with that CEO a whole lot. And so it's not the CEO's conduct that matters because the CEO is often symbolically in front of the organization, giving speeches, talking about things, but not many people interact. The daily experience that they have is with their boss and their peers, with their team. And so the quality of that team, whether that team is working well together and whether I feel good about my boss, my supervisor, makes all the difference in the world in terms of people's experience. So I would say generate good leadership among the supervisors, and that's going to make a huge difference in the culture. The second thing, and this is something that, you know, I've learned over time, and I talk with so many leaders about this. They'll talk to me about their team and how the team isn't working well together, and then Usually about 50% of the time, maybe even more, it will point to a single individual on the team, or maybe two, who aren't playing well in the sandbag, in the sandbox with other people. And the experience of the team gets um, uh, impaired significantly as a result of that one or two people. And now we have a supervisor who's responsible for that team. And the supervisor says, well, that one person performs so well, or that one person, you know, I, I hate to let them go. They've got three kids. One of the kids has got, you know, some kind of problem. I don't want to fire them. They've been a loyal soldier for the organization. And so they hold on to that person who doesn't play well in the sandbox, who then impairs the rest of the group. I can't tell you the number of times you take out that one person, you make the non-individual humanistic choice. You know, it's not humanistic toward the individual, but it's extraordinarily humane for the organization or for the team. 
And so great leaders understand that their job is not to take care of the individual. Their job is to take care of the organization and the team. And you've got to make some tough choices sometimes of letting somebody go. You let that person go, replace them with somebody who plays well in the same sandbox together. And all of a sudden the team dynamics changes overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I I've seen that so many times as well. And, you know, many times it is something that's going to be helpful to that individual in the long run. Uh, if they're not playing well in the sandbox, if they're not, if they're not getting the message that they need to be a team player, uh, they're not a good fit with the organization. Chances are they're, they need a wake, wake up call or they need to find themselves in a different Absolutely. type of organization with better, with better, better alignment for them. And that's probably going to be better for them in the long term. So I, you know, when, as I think about the organizational needs and balancing that with the individual needs, you know, I, I, I have to think about not only the long term goals of the organization, but I need to think about the long term development of my people. And sometimes it's just not a good fit for whatever reason. And, and, you don't have to pass judgment, <laughs> like personal judgment on anybody uh, in terms of like, you think they're a t- terrible person. You know, people thrive in different environments. And so sometimes it's not working out yeah. for whatever reason. Cut them loose. The organization will be better for it. And and they very well may be better for it as well. That's right. I think um, the cutting loose or the, the wake up call. I just talked talk with a client yesterday who has a member of her team, uh, a senior member who's not playing well in the sandbox. And she's been hesitant to say something to that person. Doesn't want to hurt the person's feelings. That person does have some difficulties at home. Well, she finally said to the person, it's not working out for us. The way you behave, your conduct and character with this team is a problem. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's the pattern. What do you, rec- do you see this pattern? Do you recognize it? The person said, yes, I do see it. The leader said, okay, you need to get yourself handled. We would like you to stay. We think you're, you're an excellent performer individually, but you need to take this on in a big way. The person said, I will take this on in a big way. And, and um, since then, the person changed their behavior somewhat. I don't think it's sustainable until that person gets a coach or works um, at a deeper level. But at least the beginning point, it starts to change the trajectory of the conversation. I can't tell you the number of leaders that are hesitant, that shy away from that come to Jesus meeting that I think is quite powerful and useful, done well, you know, do it in a caring, kind, clear, direct way. Um, And if done well, the person might change and they might not, but if they don't let them go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Keith, uh, thank you for joining me this time. The time has flown by together today and we could continue down this path and talk for, for hours and hours. I'm sure. Uh, I do want to be respectful of your time though, and and let you get on with your day. Um, So we're going to wrap things up, but before we close, I want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out a little bit more about what you're up to, currently uh, and then give us the final word on the topic yeah sure well so uh, leadership-pathways.com is the website for my my little consulting firm and uh, also uh, in addition to consulting as you know I do a lot of leadership coaching executive coaching Um, uh, I love doing the coaching often I do it as part of my consulting work sometimes as standalone but in addition I recently wrote a book the art of transformational coaching um, and I've developed a workshop. I've been delivering this workshop now for a couple of years. And you can go to, if you're interested in becoming a a better coach, if you're a coach and interested in deepening your coaching skills, especially becoming a transformational coach, you can go to my website, artoftransformationalcoaching.com or buy the book. And uh, at that website, you can learn more about my workshop. I'm doing another one starting in late April, a 10 week workshop. Um, and I'd love listeners who are interested to, to check that out. So uh, good enough. That's enough for self-promotion for now. Um, I'm not sure I have any, any final words. Um, you might have some final words as well. Uh, I just want to remind listeners, and I know I'm biased. I know I am. 
I do have a bias toward culture, but separate from the bias, if you look at the research, look at Built to Last, John Cotter's research, wonderful book called, called Corporate Culture and Performance, um, uh, uh, Good to Great, uh, are among the bodies of research that keep showing over and over again, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, you know, and, and strategy is important, but getting people aligned around the strategy is a cultural problem. It's an organization behavior problem. It's not a strategic problem. You can have the most brilliant strategy in the world, but if you don't have a culture that can pull it off, you don't really have a strategic advantage. So I guess yeah. I do have parting words. There you go. <laughs> well, that's that's absolutely correct. Uh, thank you, Keith. It has been a real pleasure talking with you again today. I appreciate all of your insights, sharing your experience and your expertise with my listeners. As I, I hope that everyone will uh, reach out, get connected with Keith, find out more about his workshop, his, his new book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.